Brothers and sisters, this reflection is going to start off on a much lighter note than a m more recent reflections, I, I must say. And uh, a much lighter note, and pardon that pun, which you don't even know is a pun yet, but it, you'll see as this brief reflection unfolds. Uh, there was a singer-songwriter, very famous in the 60s, actually stayed very active even up until this day and age. His name is Bob Dylan. He started out <clears throat> kind of a bohemian life, I, I believe, in New York City and Greenwich Village and all of that, coffee houses, and, uh, and, and remained and still remains active in, in music circles, from uh, folk music to country music to a little bit of, of rock, a, a very eclectic taste. I bring it up uh, for a few reasons. Now, one of the reasons is uh, he's the fa one of the favorite uh, singer-songwriters of, uh, of my classmate in the Episcopacy, uh, Bishop Robert Barron. In fact, uh, Bishop Barron actually, in one of his reflections a year or so ago, actually accompanied himself on the guitar and sang a Bob Dylan song. Uh, don't turn off your, your uh, YouTube <laughs> feed or whatever you're, you're watching this reflection on. I guess I'm not going to play the guitar, which I really can't. Uh, nor am I going to sing a Bob Dylan song. I could do that, but I don't want, don't want to torture you with, uh, with my voice uh, or trying to imitate his, uh, his voice. But there is a song that applies to what I really want to speak about. And it's a song written by him entitled, The Times They Are A-Changin'. And that is uh, the, the key phrase. It seems to me the times are certainly a-changin'. And, and they're not all welcome changes. They're not all good changes. We know that. We've certainly experienced that in our culture, in our society, in the dominant culture that surrounds us, the political climate that impacts us every day. Uh, we, we have certainly experienced that the times are, are changing, and again, not in very good ways. Which brings me to the more sober and serious part of this reflection, and it's connected, our opposition to Proposition 1. I'm, I'm appealing to uh, people of, of all faiths. I'm appealing to people of good faith. I'm appealing to people who, are, who maybe have no faith in, in some ways, as we traditionally consider that, but who are still human. And, and we are all capable of, of uniting around a common cause that, that is good and that is just and that makes sense. Uh, in other words, even based our approach, I believe, on common sense, common human sensibilities. So the proposition that would uh, enshrine in the Constitution uh, the right to abortion without any limits at all uh, and impose that uh, through the Constitution, that amendment to the Constitution here in the state of California and why and, and how we would totally be opposed to that. On a common sense level, for example, uh, we hear people on the, the pro-abortion side constantly uh, repeating and constantly harping upon the whole concept of choice. Well, so often we have no choice in the matter when it comes to uh, the, the opposition in, in the realm of the ethical and the moral, specifically abortion. This proposition is a, a clear example of, of that. It didn't come from the people. It, it, it didn't come from, uh, for example, uh, what a, a, a normal course would be for a proposition to go on the ballot here in the state of California, uh, which would involve a, a lengthy and difficult and challenging uh, program and effort to collect a certain number of signatures, hundreds of thousands of signatures, so that a proposition could qualify for the ballot. It's a very expensive uh, proposition uh, to put together as well. Well, that didn't happen here. Proposition 1 wasn't, uh, wasn't put forward by the people. It was put forward by uh, sen state senators and state, state assembly people. Uh, and uh, not representing me, probably not representing certainly 
the 74% uh, of the people in this country who, who are in opposition to late-term abortions, and this proposition would open up the floodgates to that sort of thing in our country. So, common sense, the common good, where is that in this? It, it's not there on that side of the equation. So, we weren't asked. It, it, it was, uh, in a sense, effort, effortless, effortlessly put on the ballot, and we had no choice in the matter. But now we do have a choice. We have a choice to vote against Proposition 1. We can make our voices heard. On another level, which I would appeal to uh, people of, of all faiths and maybe no faith, uh, another issue involved in this is the, the, the repetition of, well, follow the science, listen to the science. We believe in science. We trust the science. Well, we do too. Let's look at the biology. Let's, let's look at the fact of the, of the matter. Uh, just very recently in a, a, a press conference, I, I mentioned that if a single cell creature, plant or animal life, were found under the ice caps of Mars, the headline would be Life on Mars. And in the articles about it and the commentary about it, they would be referring to that life as Martian life. And politicians would be falling over each other to be the first to propose legislation to protect Martian life and God help anyone who would destroy that single cell animal or any of its cousins on that planet because it would be forbidden. It, it would be taking Martian life. Well, the, the irony is always lost on these folks. Why don't they apply that same principle to human life? We do from conception to natural death. A few months ago, I was watching a, a program on baby animals, uh, pregnant animal mothers. And it was on the National Geographic Channel, I believe. It was, it was cute. It was, it was warm and fuzzy. It, it was actually beautiful. Uh, <laughs> but I think the irony was lost on the producers and directors of, of that program as they were showing, for example, a sheepdog that was going to have puppies and a, a, a beautiful elephant that they were calling a a mother and an attentive mother taking good care of herself and her pregnancy and speaking of of the elephant fetus growing in her womb as this precious little baby and with the technology that we have actually having pictures in utero in from the womb of these animal uh, fetuses and embryos to be born but they didn't call them a pregnancy tissue they didn't call them clumps of cells they called them babies about to be born they called their uh, their animal mothers mothers <laughs> and we need to apply that to us to humans to human life so proposition one speaks of taking the life potentially of a healthy human baby up to nine months of pregnancy a healthy human baby from a healthy mom, no questions asked, and no reason need, need be given. Brothers and sisters, that is, that is simply so wrong on so many levels. The times they are a-changing. Our hearts need a-changing. So I want to leave you with a very powerful scripture that you've heard before, but like all scripture, as St. Paul says, it's, it's useful for teaching. And good things bear repeating. This certainly does. It comes from chapter 36 of the prophet Ezekiel. For I will take you away from among the nations, gather you from all the foreign lands, and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you to cleanse you from all your impurities, from all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart. And I will take from your bodies your stony hearts, giving you natural hearts. I will put my spirit within you and make you live by my statutes, careful to observe my decrees. God's statutes, God's decrees, God's commands, God's take on human life. And we know that it begins at conception. 
and it must be cherished and protected from conception to nine months of, of pregnancy through years of human life until natural death. God bless you and those you love always and in every way.